Hey there, coaches. I'm Rich Prado, owner of Play in School and host of Travel Ball Talk, where I talk to travel ball coaches from the best organizations about the current and future state of travel baseball. Today's episode features my friend, Nelson Gore, founder of the Illinois Indians and current director of baseball for NCSA. Nelson is as deep in the trenches of travel baseball as anyone in the industry. We discuss many topics in this conversation, including an equation for recruiting he simply refers to as one. I hope you enjoy this episode of Travel Ball Talk. All right, welcome back to another episode of Travel Ball Talk. Today we're heading back to the Midwest. I feel like I've been camped out in the Midwest the last few episodes. Today we're going to talk with Nelson Gord. Nelson's a buddy of mine. He is the owner, founder of the Illinois Indians, and he is currently running. He's the director of baseball for NCSA. He is all over Twitter. He is all over the uh, the coaching clinic scene. He uh, speaks with high schools. He speaks with travel teams. He he speaks anywhere that'll let him speak. And, and sometimes he just just talks to talk. I think. But um, <laughs> Nelson and I will have. Basically, the phone call that we're about to record, we do this on a quarterly basis, and um, and we just never recorded it before. So, Nelson, welcome to the call. Yeah, thanks, Rich, for having me. And yeah, like you said, we've had this conversation or some part of it over and over now, so uh, it's almost on on repeat with a little bit, a few new additions. Sometimes we'll just have to, to be here. we'll have to check our language today a little bit just in case there's kids listening. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So, but um, so Nelson, I want to hear a little bit about just give me your your quick bio for those of you who are for you know for those listening at home who maybe you know haven't heard of Nelson Gord. Give us the quick bio, and then I want to hear about the foundation story of the Illinois Indians because that's not one that I think I I know the whole story of. So I'll uh, I'll let you have the mic. Sure. Yeah. So, um, my background, I grew up in the Chicagoland area, actually, you know, probably five miles from our current home base for the Illinois Indians. Um, so, you know, real familiar with the landscape, went to Buffalo Grove high school, um, was a multi-sport athlete and, you know, kind of went back and forth between playing football and college or football and baseball. Um, knowing that baseball is probably a better route, but never really had the tools or resources or understanding how to how to go about that recruiting process uh, nobody in my family had really been through it beforehand and uh, so it was all new it was all kind of a novelty uh, towards the end of my senior year decided to write a bunch of letters to a bunch of division one programs because I'm like hey I'm the player of the year in this conference and we have dudes getting drafted and guys going to big ten schools and you know I think I could play at your place um so fortunately, UIC was in transition, Illinois, Chicago, um, and offered me a spot on the on the roster as a non-scholarship player. Uh, they brought in 21 guys that year, so I wasn't, <laughs> I guess it wasn't all that special, um, being that it was such a big class, but, you know, the timing was right. And uh, from there, you know, had a, had a great experience at UIC, um, graduated, and then went on to play a few years of independent ball. Uh, in the Northern League and signed a free agent contract with the, the Astros in 2007 and spent a spring with them. Uh, at the end of that spring, they offered me a coaching position. <laughs> so I knew the the writing was kind of on the wall with that and then uh, sailed off into the sunset with one more year playing independent ball down in Kansas City and, uh, you know, then hopped right into the uh, the coaching circuit. So that's the the playing background. What what year um, what year did you finish high school? Finished high school in ninety nine. Finished at UIC in 04, and then finished playing in two thousand seven. You, you know, you sound Sorry, exactly. I had, a, I had a red shirt. I had a red shirt year in there uh, as a freshman. You you sound to me exactly like the kid that John Sarna with CSA with Chicago Scouts Association would be so passionate about helping right now. How, how, how does a kid like you slip through the cracks in, in the recruiting process? And, um, you know, I think, I think between the Indians and, you know, everything that the Chicago Scouts Association and all those 
big time organizations kind of in in that midwest um part of the country right there it's it's really elevated the uh the exposure for that chicago kid and um you know not only chicago i just just got off the phone with rj fergus from the hitters up towards milwaukee yep. so it's not like there weren't players up there and there haven't been players but you know the the one of the positives of travel ball is bring bringing the eyeballs um, to those players. So fast forward and 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 catch us up on um, on uh, you know your coaching. Yep. Uh, yeah. So you know while I was playing uh, professionally, I was always always training and, and giving lessons in the off season at a facility that wasn't too far from where I lived. Um, you know, I'd also serve as like a kind of like a GM type role during the winters, managing the schedule on top of giving the lessons. And then when I decided to hang them up, um, I, I can't use the word retire because if you retire, I think that has to be playing at a little bit of higher level. Yeah. Um, when I decided to hang them up, um, you know, there, there was a lot of things going on. I was, I was getting married that off season, you know, bought a, a town home, so life was just kind of in transition. And I told the guy that owned the facility at the time, like, listen, I need a career. I can't just have a job. Uh, so went out and started interviewing different places, had some inside and outside sales opportunities, you know, that general marketing um, uh, ad that you'll see or classified ad that you'll see. Um, so I had four or five different job offers, brought them back to the guy at the facility. And he's like, well, I can't match, you know, some parts of this, but we could figure out a way to creatively structure it. And what came of that was, you know, this real incentive-laden contract that had to do with facility usage time and equipment sales. And I'm like, well, you know, if I just start my own program and manage that, that'll check all these boxes and get me to that highest tier of commission or um, reach all these different, you know, in- incentives that he's laid out for me. And to be honest with you, it's probably one of the best years financially I've ever had because, um, he wrote something that he thought was impossible under the current system, <laughs> but I created something that supplemented it. And then everything I did above and beyond that was just gravy. Um, and as a response to that, you know, uh, I actually purchased the facility from him on 8808, the day the Olympics started. Never forget it. Uh, great time to start a business, right? Great time to start a small business when housing market crashes. Uh, banks go haywire. You have all that stuff going on. So to be 25, 26 years old and, and hop into owning a small business and arguably the, the roughest time in financial history since the depression, um, pretty ridiculous. So I, I learned a lot, uh, the hard way pretty quickly. Um, but you know, so much good has come out of it. Um, the Indians obviously grew from just three teams an 11, 12 and 13 year old team way back then, you know, to now between the teams that are branded Indians and then the overall ITB or Illinois travel baseball umbrella. Um, we manage in one way, shape or form, you know, 25 to 30 different teams. Um, and we probably pro bono consult another 25 to 30, just guys, younger guys that were like me 10 years ago that are starting their own programs in different parts of the state that, um, you know, we'll hop on a call like this and just talk about best practices and uh, try to shorten their learning curve a little bit and, you know, then watching them grow and, and teaming up on future projects. Now, that that brings us a little more current. You are uh, with NCSA. So I'm assuming you're not over at that facility on a day-to-day basis, are you? No, no, actually, I, I just speak with, uh, we have two guys that are, running the day-to-day operations, Mike Pugliese and Bryce Skelton, uh, two guys that actually both played for me, uh, both played in the program. And I think that's the real benefit of, of having that longevity, you know, now being at the 12-year mark in our history, is that out of the 30, 30 or so coaches that we, that we employ or that we utilize uh, throughout the Indian season, you know, normally two-thirds of those guys have, have went through it themselves. So they know the expectation, they know the, the routines, they know, you know, the way things should look and feel and, and just the entirety of the culture that we've created. That's pretty cool. But you're, you're still the, the, the main owner of the uh, facility? 
Uh, not in the facility. So the the Illinois Child Baseball Club is a is a 501c3 nonprofit, and the actual brick and mortar part of the facility, um, which is called Playball USA, I sold off in in 2013. Got so it. we just are a, a sub. We're a sub tenant, or we're a tenant of the uh, got it of the facility itself. Got it. Cool. Cool. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> so before before we jumped on the line, actually, it was a few days ago when we were texting back and forth. And I and I always want to you know if you if for folks who've listened to this thing um, more than once, I'm trying to give uh, the featured guests an opportunity to to talk about whatever, you know, whatever itch they're trying to scratch, whatever topic is kind of top of mind for them right now. And when I texted you the other day, you, you sent back a reply that was something about leveling the playing field. Can, um, can you explain kind of what that means and, and kind of open up the, the discussion with, uh, with that topic for us? Yeah. Um, well, what prompted it was that I was out in Cary, North Carolina at the USA Baseball High School Invitational uh, watching some of the guys that played for our Chicago South Association team, uh, Jason Hodges, Kendall Ewell, uh, those guys who played for Marist High School. And somebody was calling my name. You know, I was videotaping those kids hit, and somebody's calling my name from behind. And I look back, and it happened to be, you know, a kid that played for us like 10 years ago. Um, played at a local high school, played in the Indians program, and went on to Webster University down near St. Louis. And now he's a, a video, not intern, but he's in the video department with the White Sox. So we had a great conversation. You know, it was great to catch up. I hadn't seen him in a, in a really long time. Um, but I asked him, like, hey, what advice would you give a younger version of yourself or really any kid that wanted to play at the next level? And, you know, the... The response was flattering, but not surprising. And he's like, I, I just wish I would have listened more to guys like yourself or other coaches that told me uh, that I should have broadened my horizons or, or been more proactive in, in looking at different schools. And, you know, that, that was really cool to hear. And, you know, just being reflective on that, that's what made me send you that text message because there are so many kids out there that, you know, yeah, perception is reality in the moment. Um, but oftentimes perception is far from reality because you look all over Twitter and you look all over, you know, the various websites and people get all excited about, you know, these guys committing to power five schools, um, but they don't see the whole story, right? They don't see the, (laughs) that the kid lasted a semester, went back to a junior college, went to a second junior college, ended up in an NAIA program, um, just because they were pursuing something and hopped into something a little bit too quick rather than finding, you know, what was the best fit or the right fit for them. They did what was, you know, the right now decision uh, and in anything in life, normally that doesn't work out too well. You know, that's, gosh, it makes me, my, my mind race when I, when I hear that. The the first thing is, uh, let's go back to the, to the first thing you were there videotaping he was there videotaping i've been preaching videotape for going on 11 no way going on going (laughs) on 11 years now guys it's time you got to get tape on you guys there's a there's a reason every single pro scout carries a stopwatch a radar gun and a video camera he has a boss and he wants to see it um your word coaches on the other end listening to this thing your word is awesome and we trust it but our eyes want to see that swing. Our eyes want to see that arm. Our eyes want to see that body. Anyway, I digress. No, but yeah, I mean, we, we could. That's like, that's not a shameless plug because that's that's that is the be all end all when it comes to everything that we're doing, whether it's player development, recruiting, player promotion, um, video is at the core of all those yeah. things. And when you asked before about about my history in the game, what actually transitioned me from those 11, 12, 13 year old teams into really just staying in the high school market was my obsession with that part of it. Uh, mm-hmm. We we had some local high school showcases out here and I went to the guy that had been running it for, you know, nearly 20 years. And I'm like, Hey, let me videotape all these kids. Mm-hmm. 
um, one, there was, you know, my motive for growing my program and getting that face time with them. Uh, but most importantly, there were so many schools out there that, to your point, I, I'd call up on the phone or I'd send an email to, you know, singing praises over a player. And the first thing they'd ask me, do you have any video on them? Yeah. And that was before, like, YouTube was as easy to use. And, you know, like, there were some hurdles there to overcome. And, you know, the and the quality of the video that you can send between phones or um different devices wasn't anything like it is today but you know you could even see back then how important it was and it's still i mean if you go to our indians youtube page i think we have i don't know ten thousand videos up there uh in varying degrees degrees of quality and and serving different purposes but yeah video is paramount and and anything that you do in in this game paramount so i want to take a quick break from this interview to ask you a favor coaches I'd like you to text me video of your best uncommitted 2021 left-handed pitcher. Text it to 804-852-8468. That's my cell number. Once again, 804-852-8468. Now, do me another favor. Text me your best uncommitted high academic 2020 player. See, in the time... It's taken me to read this message. Coaches that partner with Play in School could have easily completed this task. When college coaches ask for film on a kid, speed matters. Access matters. We make film easy to use and organized with all of your players in one spot with no stupid passwords to have to remember. If you struggled to text me film on that left-handed pitcher and that high academic kid, maybe it's time you schedule a call with me. Text 804-852-8468 to set up a call. Visit playinschool.com slash teams to see all of the organizations that already trust us with their college recruiting videos. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, so I did want to go back, and there's a couple of other things in that in your original uh, story about that guy. Let's let's touch on when he, when he talked about, you know, just being able to kind of look backwards and and you know realizing about uh, how important it was to not only to be proactive but to look to the look for a place that's the right fit. I mean, you know, how often have you or I preached? Um, this concept of of self evaluation, right? That that piece is so critical to landing in a program that's going to be the you know where you're able to um, have success, all kinds of success, S- success athletically, success academically, um, you know, have fun socially, all of it, all of it. Um, this this idea of transferring i mean it's it sounds easy on paper but it's a it's a pain and not only does it cost time it costs money you know when you're losing credits and um don't even get me started about the cost of college today i don't want to go down that rabbit hole today um Mm -hmm. so but something else that you were you were touching on you know these these kids who you know, or call it the the top, the top of the top. They're super easy to identify. I can identify them. My mother can identify them. Okay, it's it's not that hard. We can figure out who they are. And when they when they're landing at um, at a certain school, you know, we're we're seeing it all over Twitter about you know their their coaches basically patting themselves on the back for getting a kid placed in, you know, when you, when you place a six foot four left-hander who's 92 to 94 in the sec, real, real tough. Do do, do you need to pat yourself on the back that hard? And, and, you know, not, you know, not to bust these guys shots, but I see guys breaking their arms to pat themselves on the back. And and again, it's like, he's the easiest guy in the country to identify. Um, and there, and there's lots of, there's lots of those types of guys, like basically the entire ACC and sec looks like that. Those kids are better. Sure. So that's leading me to to this topic that that you and I have touched on before. It's like where 
where you see where you see a lot of the you know staffs of travel teams who were spending vast majorities of their time marketing a player who almost needs no help right, right. so so, so well, talk about that for me yeah well it's not that they don't need any help right they uh, need a different type of help 100 percent. yeah they need right. they, yeah they need a, a much different approach and you know there's actually the the alumni section on our website which is being redone by the way uh that should be done uh, by may 1st but uh we've always had this short paragraph posted there and it's something to the effect of you know these players all wore our uniform at some point in time it may have been for a tournament may have been for a season may have been for multiple seasons but they're not playing college baseball because of us yeah. right they're doing it because of their work ethic their passion uh, what they did in the classroom and we're just happy that we can be a part of their story and you know the things that that's their story right i think if you were to look at, at our story um, the things that would take up the chapters in that would be the ones about a kid like Shane O'Leary, who was the oldest of nine children. They lived in a in a um, you know trailer park community. They were on government subsidized housing, homeschooled his entire life. Um, nobody in his family had ever been to college, and because of our relationship and because of you know his commitment to the game. Um, Rich Benjamin, who's now at Indiana Wesleyan, but was at Judson at the time, you know, he was willing to take a chance on a kid like that. And he graduated in three and a half years with straight A's, um, playing college baseball, you know, and is now married and has a great job and has totally transformed uh, the trajectory of his life uh, because of that. Like, those are the things that are most successful in his is Shane O'Leary ever going to show up on a MLB draft board? No. Was he talked about in, in power five conference war rooms and recruiting boards? No. Um, but that's what we pride ourselves in is, is those one-off stories and the ones that are transformative and the kid sticks. And it was done because of our relationship with the player, his, his willingness to put himself out there and broaden his horizons. And just applying all those tools so that they can make the the best choice. Um, again, not just the one that's easiest for us that we can plaster all over social media and our website. Um, that's that's too easy. That 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 is easy, and it's fun. And again, not to take away from from those stories too, you know. But when you're choosing between no, Virgin no, not at all. You know, when you're choosing between Virginia, Vanderbilt, and Florida, that's it's pretty good. That's pretty good picking. Um, well, yeah, and that's. And that's why those kids need, you know, a different type of help. Like I was saying, sure. when, when you're, when you're faced with those opportunities, I see that so often where those, those kids transfer out for various reasons, or even if they stay at the school, um, they made it purely on the baseball aspect of it or how the coach was or um, that school's success in athletics, rather than checking all the boxes like, Hey, does this have the major I'm even looking for? Right. Like what, what's their graduation rate? Um, what does this scholarship mean? Like, you know, 30, 40, 50, you know, if you get north of 50 percent on a scholarship, that's incredible in baseball. But, you know, 50 percent at Northwestern is different than 50 percent at um, Union University. Right. So the way that that plays out and, you know, the the long-term financial impact of that these are all things that you need to consider and that's where those kids probably need the most help and the most education is understanding the nuances of what that scholarship offer means and then the long-term impact you know coming out of it you know and I, I i didn't want to go down this particular path too much on um but but you bring to mind those nuances those are difficult for a 17, 18 year old to grasp. Imagine being a 13, 14 year old and being, and being pressed yep. on that. And, and that's, that's again, why it, that's odd uh, again. And I'll reiterate it for the thousandth time. I'm not against the early commitment. I'm against those early commitments that decommit, um, yep. you know, but again, those, when those decommitments happen, it, that's, that's, you see some maturity and they, you realize and somebody made a bad decision and, it, sure. you know, in, in some ways you, Hey, at least you got out of that relationship, you know, before things really got serious. Um, but, 
but man, the, the, the nuance, as you put it, the, the devil's in the details, right? Those things are so important because when you miss that, because we're talking about what we're talking about when you're choosing a college is, is a kind of important decision. It's a really, really big decision. And when, a little bit. when, when taken lightly and making decisions off of, you know, how, how, you know, what kind of record did the team have last year? That's, that's, you know, that's, uh, kind of, uh, naive i think is the best way to put it it's not taking into account all of the information that should be taken into account is what i'm trying to right. say and but i mean on the opposite end of that um what is really encouraging to see and we've seen it you know over the past several years and then just in the past week if you look at the, the parody um that there is in the game you know, in all college athletics, right? You look at yep. uh, the basketball tournament that just happened and you see the that leveling of the playing field. You look at uh, the upsets, right? Just this past week in college baseball, um, you're seeing that those next tiers of Division One programs uh, start to catch up in some areas. I mean, I think over a, a series, it's going to be still tough to compete because of the depth of talent. Sure. Um, but just the, the access to information now, is so much greater than it's ever been that those that invest their time into doing that homework and understanding those nuances and, and seeing what else is out there other than just the schools that can name off the top of their head. Um, they're having a lot of success and that's cool to see because you do see both ends of it with that. Uh, the ones that just jump into things and the ones that, that take their time and really treat it as a process and not just reactionary. Before we hit record, you talked about, if if there were a way to track some sort of national metric tracking, uh, I, I don't even know, uh, I guess the right word is retention, um, yep. where Illinois Indians, at, at least in, in your mind, you, f- you feel like their retention once they land on campus is, you know, in the top 1%. Um, talk, how, wh- why do you think that, how do you think that happens? What's the... What's the reasoning, and why, why is that important, first of all? Sure. Um, well, why is it important? Yeah. Uh, Rhetorical. Yeah, I think you said that earlier, right? Yeah. The, Rhetorical yeah, I mean, question. The loss of credits, the, the uh, amount of money, all that stuff. So it, it is super. It's at the highest level of importance to us to make sure that they end up at the right place. Um, and, again, it has to check all those boxes. But I think the reason that we're successful in that area is because they're educated on exactly that from such a young age. Like we have our youth program that's branded as the Illinois Dodgers. Um, We, for a long time, have done a a 14-year-old just one or two event team that we've taken to various places called the the Chill, um, which we take. It's kind of like an an all-star team of 13- and 14-year-old players which is an introduction to our Indians program. But even when they are in seventh and eighth grade, even the top players that are the ones that could potentially be forced with or introduced to making one of those long-term decisions, you know, we're educating them on the different division levels, the, the spectrum within each division level, that your top division three teams, you know, can on any given day beat many of the division one programs. You know, I, I use it all the time because Illinois is Illinois is such an easy one um, to paint that picture with because we have 90-plus schools in the state that play college baseball. Uh, right now, I know they're in the top five for sure. They might still be number one, but Concordia University, right? They, they're top in the books in Division Three. North Central is always up there. Augustana has been up there. Illinois Wesleyan has won a Division Three national championship. Um, you look at Division twos, right? Illinois Springfield was number one in the country for a while last year. Um, you have your Lewises. You have your, your, you know, you have all these schools, Quincy, which we've sent players to. You have quality Division two programs. And then we have a dozen or so Division one programs, right, from Chicago State, who's not traditionally very strong, um, to our, you know, our Illinois, Northwestern, our Big Ten programs. We have teams from the Valley and from the Horizon League. Um, and I just ask them, like, if you look at what we've done in junior colleges, NAIAs, 
Division Three, those are the ones that are going to the the end of the year tournaments every year. Yeah. It's a lot harder for those in state Division One programs to. Oh, and you couple that with the fact that Division One programs have significantly less money to give you that you're going to be out of pocket a lot more in yes. Division One program than you would at any of those other ones, mm-hmm. uh, regardless of what the sticker price is. Like, what is your best decision? Nobody ever says, okay, I want to be in a, in a lot of debt and I want to sit on the bench. <laughs> so that's so what the one route oftentimes is going to equate to, uh, whereas, you know, some of these other options that we have are fantastic, right? Oakton, Oakton won the, the Division Three NJCAA National Championship last year. Only one team can say that. Yep. You know, and we didn't even have a we didn't have a lot of other teams even make the tournament at the higher level. So, um, I think that's why it's just the the education, it's the learning curve, it's being transparent with the parents and letting them know that regardless of what school that, that you end up at, um, it's going to be pretty damn good. Right, you're gonna have an, a great experience. The the dudes on your team, your teammates are are gonna be the best men in your wedding, the godfather of your children. Um, and whether you're on a campus with thirty thousand kids or three thousand kids, it's not gonna change the thirty dudes that you know have a, a name across their chest and a number on their back that are are playing for the same mission as you. Good stuff, man. Um, let's talk about the Indians for a second. <clears throat> what do you what do you think the Indians? kind of special sauces. What are y'all doing, you know, different or better, um, unique, something, you know, obviously don't, you don't, you don't have to share trade secrets or anything, but something that a coach listening on the other end might, might be able to pick up and, uh, and implement with his guys, whether that's, you know, something on field or whether it's off the field it might be, you know, in the back office, you know, what, what is something that you feel has, has given y'all some, some edge. Um, yeah, I know we were talking about it a little bit earlier about the group training aspect. Mm. Um, we've been doing that for six, seven years where so much of the baseball training industry was built around individual lessons, which certainly have value, right? They, they, they do. And it's no different than having a tutor, right? But, um, what it does eliminate is that interaction or being able to see others, engaging in those activities mm-hmm. or, or learning from watching your peers or seeing how coaches interact with other players. Right. Yep. And I think back to my own experience, I learned more about hitting, uh, just standing around the batting cage and watching guys and talking to guys about what they felt and what, what they were doing. And, you know, it, it's probably been six, seven years now since we started doing that, but, um, all of our training, our, our hitting instruction, our infield work, um, our catcher's work, we pair it up so there's four or six kids per coach, mm-hmm. and they have 45-minute sessions. Uh, so every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night from 7 p.m. till 10.30 at night, uh, we'll have that, that four to six to one player-to-coach ratio, and you can you know cover all your skills. Um, this is so the... And that's been significant because... This, yeah, go ahead. this is the second time and you know the last two calls where this concept of group training has come up um uh, and by coincidence a friend of yours from right up the road rj fergus with the yep. hitters is he he was saying they they do almost zero almost no individual lessons at all anymore um i mean we and, and i talked i talked with him at length about that and about the about the uh the advantages of it i i'm all in if somebody's running yeah. a facility if you haven't played around with the concept of you know the the group with four to six to me it's a it's a no-brainer and what i spoke with with rj about it's you know the facility is going to make a couple extra bucks if priced correctly yep. mom and dad are going to save a substantial amount of money and oh yep. by the way your kids are probably going to get better. It yep. where, Where's the downside? Where's the downside? There's none. And that's, that's, that's exactly right. Like you're, you're, you're maximizing, I don't want to say profits, but you're, it, it's the most cost effective way of doing it both for the family and for the facility. And it's really scalable, 
Yes. Right. So if a kid, if you have a group of four to six athletes that are working and one dude can't make it because he needs to study for a test, it doesn't send you into this, you know, like, what do I do? I have to fill this spot. Right. And on the opposite end of it, going back to that example I used before of the, the kid that was homeschooled and, um, you know, didn't have any money. That's a great opportunity. If you have a group of like three or four kids and you have that kid that really ha- is a financial hardship case, yeah. you know, that is coming from a great distance or that you just know, like he wants it and your decision to be able to serve him um, could set him off into something much greater. You could slot him in there and it's not taking money out of anybody's pocket. Yeah. Nobody's going to bat an eye at it. And like you are doing something so powerful for that individual that, um, you couldn't do in an individual lesson type setting. So yeah. just a multitude of reasons why, it's, like you said, like what is the downside? It's, it's amazing. I, I hope that, I hope that people who are running facilities are, um, are, are taking note of this concept. I've, I've had people, you know, just in, in Twitter conversations, give unbelievable pushback on this pushback, you know, cause the math, if, the math, if I give one on one for a living. The math is the math is kind of interesting because if you say let's go um, let's go f- uh, five guys at yep. twenty five bucks, 20. your 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 coach exactly. is making one hundred and twenty five bucks an hour, and the guy, the guy on Twitter gives me pushback because he says those are lo- lawyer rates, and why should a why should a um, baseball coach be making lawyer rates? That and I go well, you probably don't, you know, right? <laughs> you, you know, but well, that, that's. I mean, after that, I mean, that's if you do it just a one on one, then there it takes a lawyer to be able to pay a hitting instructor a uh, hundred bucks. So, so really, like you've created this systemic issue where only the rich kids can get better. Um, on the opposite end of it, which I mean, you know, from our past conversations, that's the thing that I probably fight against more than anything is, um, you know, continuing that divide. Well, right, right, because the flip side is. Is that well? But mom and dad now only have to pay twenty five bucks. That's that's huge. Ver- Beautiful versus, thing versus yep. versus you know the the standard um, hour rate these days seems to be north of eighty bucks. Um, you know, depending on what yep. part of the country you're in. Uh, and and if mom and well, if mom and dad want to pay it, cool. I just think the group yep. model, the group model with maybe a token one on one, is probably a great. Uh, plan of attack a great plan of attack yep. so let's talk and, about and i'll give you go ahead go ahead yeah i, I was gonna add one more thing on to that um one really interesting thing i did when i was still in the, the facility day in and day out um i actually upped it a level where i told a couple kids that i knew had really high ceilings um that could have easily went down the wrong path mm-hmm. i'm like listen i'm gonna do the opposite i'm not gonna charge you to come in I'm going to charge you if you don't show up. And if you think I'm joking, like I will invoice your parents. Wow. If you don't show up all three nights a week yeah. and for both the Saturday and Sunday practices. Yeah. Um, so you can come for the whole winter for free because what that did and those kids did, they were there like 80, 90% of the, the entire winter yeah. and both went on to be, you know, division one players. Um, but more importantly, they stayed out of trouble. Did, is what more importantly they they stay they stayed out of trouble and and they were in your facility working they stayed out of trouble were in the facility working but then in that group setting all of a sudden you have the cream of the crop of the talent of your kids mm. that other kids in the program are able to lean on and see put in the work and learn from and the power in that is so much greater than than really than even bringing in a big leaguer to come talk to your kids um, because that consistency that um, you know, that every day being able to see it, you know, that's what the game is, is based on, right? It's a day in and day out. I I, I don't like the word grind, but that's what it is, but you have to have grit uh, to be able to, to accomplish that. But then you also need someone that you're looking at that is, that is living that out um, to show you that it, it, it is possible. And I think that really, you know, influenced a lot of these kids that are now, you know, in juniors and seniors that were in seventh, eighth grade or freshmen uh, when we were doing it with those guys. And that, that's perpetuated itself as well. So it's neat to see. Um, let's change gears just a touch. Um, you you are in the trenches 
as as much as anybody is with um obviously with with the Indians um but now with your current role with NCSA you're communicating with I mean with as many different travel ball coaches parents and college coaches as probably anybody in the country um what what are some what are some things that maybe some let's let's think of a nice way of putting it what are some areas of deficiency that that some travel coaches may have that you've seen where there's let's call it opportunities for improvement um as far as little things that they might be able to do might be able to implement that could help their guys um in the future we're not and we're not talking about just going out and signing up for ncsa okay we're talking about what are what are some what are some little things that they can implement um some some things you've seen maybe some swings and misses on well two things one i think there is a lot of guys that just pick one path and go all in on that and are afraid to utilize different things there's a lot of like exclusivity um, whether it's a social media channel or a, a specific type of tournament or tournament host or recruiting channel or video, like um, they just align themselves in one way and don't realize that on the opposite end, the college coaches and the parents and the players are um, consumers that are using different channels. So there's going to be some swings and misses. You can't just match things up one to one and hope that they're going to work out. Okay. Uh, so I used, when you and I were talking before, I used the example of uh, Facebook having 13 million Twitter followers, Yeah, that's right? Fun. Facebook could view themselves as a, as a competitor to Twitter, um, but instead they realized the value that it provides and how it's way back into their system. And the same thing's so true when it comes to, to recruiting or to marketing your program. Um, broadcast yourself in a way that gets out to as many different audiences as possible um, because they're all going to be, they're all going to consume the information in different ways. Uh, so I think that's one big swing and miss. And then the, the second one, you know, is proverbial. It's a, it's a tale as old as time. It's that there are too many guys that want to do things for their players. It's to give a man a fish or teach a man to fish. Mm-hmm. And be- before, when we were talking about um, that success rate of guys staying at the colleges that they, they first decided to go to, that's a huge part of it is that we've equipped these players and these families with various resources and tools. Um, so once they have those and they understand them, you know, they put them into action and there's so much that happens outside of conversations with us and college coaches, which is a beautiful thing. When I see a kid that ends up verbally committing or, um, you know, signing to a school that we didn't have much interaction to or much interaction with, yeah, but I can trace it back through some other means. Um, that means that they really own the process um, because they're the ones that are going to be paying for it. And they're the ones that are going to be experiencing it. So why should I be the driving force? or one of our, our coaches be the driving force in that when we don't have to live it out. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the big thing. And too many coaches want to own that huge and they're really doing their players a, a disservice. And that's why you see some of those failure rates huge. right? because they didn't, they didn't consider all those deals. I'll I'll try and say that in a in a different way. Um, I've seen plenty of coaches who want to act almost like a player agent. They want to act like an agent for these for these kids. And 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 while I'll I always say networking. I mean, networking makes the world go round, right? In in every aspect of life, that is true in recruiting as well. But and you said it; these kids need to take ownership of of the process and and at the end of the day they're the ones who are going to be writing the check um and, and god i love that teach a man to fish so if you teach a man to fish instead of giving him a fish is such a is such a really awesome way to to kind of an, uh, to work into this conversation because these um these these kids need to have god, it's not it's not rocket science it's just a little bit of knowledge so that they can be active participants and be proactive in the communication because once that let's say once the travel coach can maybe use his network you know we want to use their network and kind of give that introduction well the kid needs to be involved 
God, it's uh, this yeah, is, and this is so good. This and what, is... yeah, what's remarkable to that about me is a lot of those guys don't realize that their players can actually help them grow their own network. I've had so many guys that have asked me about a school rather than me telling them about a school, mm-hmm. but then forced my hand to do some homework, uh, to reach out, to, you know, put all those things into action, which has just made everything else better. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I look at things a lot like equations. Um, you said at the beginning of, of this conversation, like I, I speak to high schools and travel coaches and all, all that different stuff. But uh, I was at a high school earlier this spring and I just came up with this equation and this acronym and it was the word one O N E spelled out. And it's that your opportunity equals your network, you know, times your effort. Right. So some people have these huge networks and they're able to put, you know, a limited amount of effort into each, but since it is a multiplication equation, you know, that's going to be the same as a smaller network where you invest tons into it. Yeah. Um, it's going to come out to be the same thing. Okay. But you create that opportunity by, you know, either having, you know, having some part of all of that. And if you take one piece of it out, then you could have, you could put in all the effort in the world that you want into training, but without that network to support it, then who's really going to see it? Yeah. Um, so th- there's a lot of things that come into play. And I, I think that's where one not only myself opportunity kind of leading, but opportunity equals network times effort. I love effort. it. That's a, that's good stuff, man. Um, yeah, I know you got to go in a, in a second. How much time do we have before you got to jump? Keep firing away. All right. <laughs> Let's Keep uh, away. let's let's dive into some of these questions I ask. Um, I'm asking every single coach. First thing, it's kind of a a little bit of a newer question. I I, I want to start asking people, and, and you don't have to go into too much depth here. Maybe maybe a one word or one sentence. But um, how do you think uh, college coaches describe Illinois Indians players? Uh, loyal. I like that. Yeah, I think um, yeah, loyal and bought in. Um, you know, I like one thing. And this goes back to to my college experience is that we didn't call Mike D or or Sean McDermott, Coach McDermott, or Coach D. I remember coming in day one, and it was like, listen, like you want us to treat you like a man, then make adult decisions. Um, you know, I don't want to create this divide. And there was a lot of things that, you know, people didn't do right. But I think that always stuck with me that, uh, like, listen, we're on the same team. We're pulling, we're pulling together. And when you look at whether it's going through the recruiting process or it's when you actually show up on campus, realize that although they are your superior by age and by um, tenure and whatever at that program, um, the lines of communication have to be open, right? And I think once you break down those silos between player and coach, uh, you're going to have guys that are a lot more loyal to you. And um, it's cool when I have, like, Ed Matthey from North Central. He was head coach at Northern Illinois uh, for a long time. They're on their spring trip. And he calls me while he's driving the team van. He's like, yeah, I have, uh, you know, Eric Outlaw, one of our former guys, sitting shotgun with me right now. And we're just talking. Just want to say hello. <laughs> like that's a, that's a really cool dynamic for a player yeah. and a coach to have to call, you know, a former coach. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it shows that, you know, they're, they're engaging uh, with each other and uh, there's more there than just writing a name on a lineup card. There's a, there's a genuine relationship, which creates that loyalty. Um, travel baseball, the state of travel baseball, what, what's going really well with it right now? And, and what, what would you like to, are there any opportunities to fix or improve, um, you know, any, any areas of deficiency with travel baseball? So talk positive and, and, you know, yeah. I don't want to say negative. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of negative, but opportunities for improvement. Well, I, I, yeah, I think the, probably the number one answer on family feud, <laughs> um, 
would probably be cost. I think that's a consistent thing yeah. that everybody continues to bring up. It really does. Um, but w- yeah, when you look at that though, and this is something I'll talk to parents about all the time, it's not us sitting around a table saying, Hey, like we we're just going to raise our prices, right? There's a whole supply and demand. There's a whole marketplace that's been created where, you know, the umpire cost goes up, the facilities realize that they can charge a higher amount because they're at a premium. Uh, so the tournaments boost their prices up. Um, there are instances where I think just because of the allure of certain events, you know, they've just went overboard and kind of, you know, set the, the high water mark a little bit too high. Um, that's raised some of that, but um, I think that it needs to, the market needs to have more transparency around that cost structure in some cases, um, but also recognize that as team operators and ones that want to serve our players and our families, that we can collaborate and create different events um, and different showcase opportunities and different video opportunities and different ways of marketing our players to reach our end game uh, without falling into that trap of feeling like we have to do all these things just because everybody else is doing it. I, I, um, that, la- that last part of that last sentence, I, I, I think is such an important piece where a lot of teams and programs are doing things because a lot of teams and programs are doing things. And, and <laughs> for a lot of them, you know, it, maybe that's not the appropriate place to go and play. You know, so so nope. part of it is scheduling wisely. Many of many yep. of the organizations could cut costs just by scheduling appropriately. You know, stick stick a little closer to home, play a little more regionally, places where mom and dad don't have to get hotel rooms for three or four nights in a row. Um, right there, you're gonna have huge savings. Um Yep. Go on, man. Tell me so, what's uh, – keep going, keep going. Yeah, so along like those lines, when it, when it comes to a destination tournament, uh, we say this at our, our preseason parent meeting and we reiterate it uh, before the summer kicks off, is that when you go to one of these destinations, view it as an experience, mm-hmm. no different than going to Disney World mm-hmm. or you know, going to Cooperstown when you're 12 years old. Like when you go to Cooperstown when you're 12, you're not talking about what colleges are going to be there. You're talking about how cool it is to sleep in bunks and Mm -hmm. have the home run derby and that experience part of it. Treat the high school summer destinations as that. Yes. And if you go into it with the outlook like I need to be seen here and you also don't have a game plan in place leading up to it as far as uh, coach outreach and, um, you know, marketing plan coming out of it, like you're not going to have recruiting success by going to – you know, Atlanta or Houston or Fort Myers or wherever it might be. Um, So it's going to, you're going to come out of it feeling unfulfilled. Yes. Uh, So, so there's that part of it. And then what we've also done to, to ease that on a lot of families is we own two team vans, right? So under a traditional model, if a family wants to go down to a week long tournament, they're going to end up spending two, three, four thousand dollars as a family between uh, transportation and hotels and meals and everything. So we fixed it on a per player per day price and that's for every event. And the idea is like, listen, mom and dad, I know that you're already financially strapped and you're putting in more hours at work and like, listen, I get it. I'm a parent as well. Um, so how do we expect you to do all those things and miss a week of work yeah. and, you know, have to like babysit, you know, like we will take care of your kids. We will give you a professional agenda and itinerary the same way you get in college ball. Yeah. You'll know who you're going to be rooming with. Um, you're you're going to know where you're going to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We're going to take care of your son. And, you know, if you trust us with that over the course of four years of high school ball, high school summer, um, you're going to save and we show them a spreadsheet. You're going to end up saving 15 to $20,000. Okay, so if cost is an issue, like that, that doesn't. And what all, what that also does, going back to the team training side, again, if you have those kids that are a true financial hardship, not people that are begging for money, 
but the ones that you know like genuinely need it, you could take that that room of two or three and add a third or fourth in there, mm -hmm. and nobody bats an eye at it. Like, yeah. listen, this family needs help, and we're not a asking you to open up your pocketbook. We're just asking you to open up your arms and open yeah. up your mind and your heart and realize that this kid needs it, and they're cool with it. So that's the way we, we try to try to make all that work. You know, something about you Midwest guys, um, you know, to, to, to bring RJ back up again, he, uh, he, he mentioned the van thing as well. Um, yep. you, you know, and he, he said, de depending on the mix of guys and, and the event, sometimes they get away with taking, I think he, he was saying a lot of times they can get away with taking just one of the, um, 15 passenger vans. Because he says a lot of times they'll have two coaches, 13 players will go in the van, and then there'll be, call it three or four kids whose parents will go on that longer trip. He says it just works yep. out a lot of times. It just works out like that um, where they can get away with just the one van, which is for anybody who, who's done the van you know, the caravan down a, a long highway for 10 hours, it's way easier with two drivers in one van than it is with one driver for two separate vans. That's tough. Um, but, <laughs> exactly. But, but And man. then one thing that, and going back to like the business lens, looking at it through that, through that yes, uh, we realized when we started that, that transportation program for the kids that we were spending, you know, 15, 17 grand a year on van rentals oh. and we're like, okay, well this doesn't make sense. And then, and then also, you know, knowing that a lot of the guys that you hired to be those travel coaches as a head coach or an assistant are guys that played for you that recently graduated. They're 23, 24, 25 years old. Then you have that, that 25 or 26, I forget what the number is, you know, having the difficulty in renting vehicles for kids oh, under that yeah. age to, yeah, sure. to drive. So, so we've circumvented that and then we've, again, made it more cost effective to us as a program and passing those savings along to the, the parents and players. The, you, you mentioned something, the, the term destination tournament, uh, the, this destination event. I've said it before where, um, I mean, I, I, I think Atlanta has turned into the Cooperstown of the older age group. It, it's, it's, yep. uh, it's an event, no different than Cooperstown. Um, you know, and, and like you said, if player, then this goes for any event. If you're not putting in work on the communication side before you go, the likelihood of a coach just showing up and, and bearing down on you is pretty low. Unless you're, unless yep. you're, unless you're, you know, unless you're, spe unless you're a guy, unless you're a dude, and then you're going to have a bunch of those. But if you're just a, a, an average guy, if you're, if you're me, then you better put in uh, some off the field work in the communication with, you know, proactively emailing, texting coaches before the event to say, Hey, here's where, here's where I'm going to be and get the coaches there to see you. You know, if, yep. without doing that work, I see it and you've seen it. A kid can go all summer without having a coach specifically come to see him, but they haven't, they haven't communicated with any. So who are they mad at? Um, right. You, you know, you, you got to give these, you got to make it easy, invite them, let them know where you're going to be. It's not, it's not rocket science. Um, it's not, it's not hard, but it's, but it's, but it's hard. You know, you got to, you got to do the work. Um, yep. What's great. What's, it, what's great about travel ball right now in your eyes? What, what are some of the, what are some of the things you're seeing? Um, either some of the old things or some of the new things you're seeing that you're, that you're loving? Um, I think that the lines of communication between programs are opened up and probably better than ever. Um, and when you get to the core of what a lot of individuals in the industry, you know, are, are going through or, or what their initial intent was, I think any person that, starts a travel baseball team or a program or opens up a facility, I would be shocked uh, to find many that didn't have good intentions, at least initially. Yeah. Um, so I think if you're able to get to the core of that and then learn from each other, uh, good things start to happen. 
And because of social media and because of, um, you know, just the way technology is and these different events and the different coaching clinics, um, there's been a lot more of that engagement. Even something as simple as, you know, it's probably only been, I've been part of the ABCA for, shoot, what, 15 years now? Mm -hmm. Um, But it's really only been in the past five years where that, that, kind of acceptance or that welcoming to the travel ball community has occurred. Mm, yeah. Um, so bring, bringing that whole market into it and then, you know, having that interaction with the high school coach, and with the college coach and, and showing how like, Hey, we're all in this thing together. Um, that's really improved uh, the overall experience and the understanding of it. So I think that's really, really good. And coming out of that, you're seeing things happen like the, like the Chicago Scouts Association and these these one-off uh, round robin events and and more of this collaborative type of line of thinking, um, so that's really helped things in travel ball. Um, Love you know, it. Kind of move it in the right direction. Love it. Yep. Listen, I'll, do, do you have any parting words? I think this would be a probably an appropriate time to let you actually go to work. Um, but do you have anything else on your mind at this, uh, this current no, moment? Only, yeah. The only thing I was going to say, and it was more about the player communication um, and, and advice for other coaches is that when you get something inbound, which we all do and all players do, they get inundated with camp invites and um, Hey, come see us. or We're going to be here. And you may not have a player that, that, meets that specific need for that coach. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you could say, Hey, you, you know what? We don't have that guy right now, but we played against this team a few weeks ago and they did. You're going to get you. I mean, you're going to be a lot more credible. You're going to earn mm-hmm. the trust in that program. And then when you speak up about one of your guys, they're going to be a lot more apt to listen. Yeah. And I think a lot of, a lot of the relationship equity that, that I've built over time has been through guys who never played for me, um, but just others asking questions and, and me being honest with them and saying yeah. like, Hey, like I saw this guy, I saw him once and he looked like, and my understanding is he's what you need. And um, that's really helped out. And, and in the same right with, with players, you know, one thing that we encourage them to do is when they're going to email a coach and saying, Hey, we're going to this tournament or that tournament include a link to our whole roster in your email to the coach. Right. Cause how, yeah. how cool is that? Like, Hey, um, I'm a 20, 21 catcher and I'm interested in your school. And the coach is like, well, you know what? We just brought in two freshmen this year. We got one on the books next year. We're probably not going to bring in a catch in that class, but we're looking for a couple arms and a middle guy. Um, if all of a sudden they can see the roster and they're like, Oh, well, you know, this kid looks pretty solid and, and they have video on their profile. Right. And, uh, and they have grades up there, but they're able to tie that back in. Now that's a reason for that coach to come out and see the player that sent the email, but also an opportunity for that player's teammates and that many to many relationship really is how you, you maximize that network effect mm-hmm. where a lot of travel coaches and a lot of players just do one-to-one, right? One college, one player, yeah, ri- one player, one college, one coach, one coach. Yeah. Um, right. A rising tide yeah. raises all ships. That's very, quite profound. <laughs> very true. <laughs> um, good stuff, man. I, I appreciate this. We've, like I said, this, if you're, if you're still listening at home, if we haven't lost you by now, this is this is the type of call uh, Nelson and I do about once a quarter. As a matter of fact, most of these phone calls of uh, the the guests we featured are are guys I talk to about once a quarter, and um, I'm glad we're starting to record these things. Uh, it's it's been a lot of fun, Nelson. I'm going to put all your contact info on the uh, show notes, but but over on Twitter you're at Nelson Gord, and definitely you aren't shy to interact with anybody. Uh, so definitely hit hit nelson up at nelson gord over on twitter and um and we'll put the links over to the illinois indians uh as well as your ncsa uh contact info as well um man i appreciate it it's been fun time flies when you're having fun i think we we're going we're gonna have to do this 
um, a little more often because I'm just looking up and seeing what time it is. And again, I know you actually have to go to work. Yeah, there you go. So uh, we all do, but it's not work when when you do what you love, right? Ah, uh, you cliche but true. Preaching, preaching to the choir, man. I'm wearing my flip flops, and I know it drives baseball people wild. <laughs> so I'll talk to you soon, man. I appreciate you. Hi, right, Rich. Thank Thanks. you. I'm having so much fun bringing these shows to you each week. If you'd like to recommend a coach for the show, please don't hesitate to shoot me a note at rich at playinschool.com or DM me on Twitter at playinschool. Again, my name is Rich Prado. I'm the founder of Play In School. My goal is to continue to create products and services that add value to you, the travel ball coaches, your players, and their parents. Visit playinschool.com to see some of the ways we're doing that. Or better yet, let's set up a call. Until next time, thank you for listening to Travel Ball Talk.